Hey, it's Thomas DeLauer, and in 10 years of working in the healthcare community and in the health world, I've been able to see firsthand what the common mistakes that people make are with their diets, right? Now, in this case, I wanna talk about the mistakes that people over 40 make because the metabolism changes, the body changes, and some of the things that we would normally do when we're younger, we shouldn't be doing as we get older. So these are six fairly important ones, actually very important ones. We're looking at fat loss, and of course we're looking at heart disease, and we're looking at just general health. So let's go ahead and let's dive into these. I'll make it short, sweet, and to the point for you. I do ask that you hit that red subscribe button so you subscribe to this channel. That way you never miss our daily videos. But also hit that bell icon so you make sure you get notifications. All right, first one that I wanna talk about is the fear of saturated fat. A lot of times, people over the age of 40, they just naturally start to limit their saturated fat intake. And rightfully so, you start to get concerned about your longevity, about your health, about your family, your kids, you wanna be around for a long time. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that saturated fat is linked to higher cholesterol levels. And higher cholesterol levels are linked to cardiovascular disease. I'm not undermining your doctor here, and I'm not trying to pretend to be your doctor, but we have to look at the big picture. LDL cholesterol is just a carrier. Okay, it's just carrying cholesterol to do its job. It's carrying lipids. LDL is necessary. If it's in our body, it's there for a reason. It's necessary. The issue comes when the LDL becomes oxidized, when the LDL really starts to cause a problem. Because LDL can form plaque, but LDL in its normal, natural, healthy form is delivering fats where they need to go. What happens is LDL gets acted upon by sugar or gets acted upon by immune cells because we're stressed out, and then the LDL becomes a problem. So when we look at the studies that show that LDL and saturated fat are bad, it's not that they're totally incorrect, it's just that they're not looking at the big picture. They're rather myopic. Okay? They look at uh, an individual, and they don't look at the whole variety of what that person is eating. They just say, this person is eating a lot of saturated fat. Now I want you to consider this for a second. Typically, someone that is eating a bunch of low quality saturated fats is generally also the same kind of person that's going to be eating a bunch of ice cream and a bunch of sugars too, right? Well, it turns out that recent evidence is demonstrating that sugar is a bigger risk of cardiovascular disease than saturated fats are. And it all comes down to the fact that sugar triggers that inflammation in the body. And that inflammation is the immune response where the body is sending macrophages, white blood cells, to certain areas of the body, therefore causing potential clogging of the arteries. Now I wanna talk about this from a fat loss perspective for a second too. Okay, saturated fat is required for fatty acid metabolism in the first place, but it's also required for the myelination of our nerves and to be able to work out and be able to stay active. If you don't have a good amount of saturated fat in your diet, then your body can't really function properly. So don't be afraid of the saturated fat. I would rather you consume the saturated fat than consume the sugar. But that doesn't mean that you should just load up on it as much as you possibly can. It's just don't be afraid of it because limiting the saturated fat is actually going to limit your satiety and put you at more risk for eating those lower, um, lower satiating foods that are rich in sugar that end up making you more hungry, right? Anyhow, let's move on to number two. It is super common to start loading up on a bunch of calcium and even take calcium supplements. Now, from a fat loss perspective, let's talk about this for a second. Calcium competes with magnesium. Magnesium is responsible for close to 400 different enzymatic processes within the body. Calcium is not responsible for quite as much. The long and the short of it is, magnesium, quite frankly, is, in my opinion, more important. And if we have a bunch of calcium, it counteracts magnesium. Magnesium is required for our muscles to relax, our skeletal muscles to relax, even for our heart muscles to relax. But it's also involved in a lot of enzymatic pathways that are involved in fat burning. If we have too much calcium coming in, we trigger what is called an excitatory response. Basically, it triggers anxiety and basically tenseness in our bodies. But that's not really what I wanna focus on. Point is, Calcium could potentially impede some fat burning, but what I really wanna focus on is heart health, right? Okay, calcium leads to calcification of your arteries. If you take calcium supplements or you try to load up on a ton of dairy to get your calcium, you absolutely, imperatively, have to be making sure you're getting vitamin D in. My first choice when it comes to vitamin D is getting it from whole food sources and from the sun, plain and simple. But I understand you're right in the height of your career. It's difficult, it really is. Trust me, even for me, running a couple of businesses, sometimes I find it difficult to see the light of day. I truly do. Sometimes I'll go a couple days and, oh my gosh, I haven't been out in the sun. It happens. So if you have to, supplement vitamin D. But vitamin D is a hormone and it signals for the absorption of calcium. We need calcium where it's supposed to be, in the bones. 
not in the blood, okay? In fact, the Journal of the American Heart Association published a study and it found that supplementing calcium increased the risk of cardiovascular disease. Yep, proven right there, right? Or at least demonstrated. Now, one of the tests that I'd like to have your doctor do, if you do go to the doctor and have them run some tests, is have them check coronary artery calcification. That is a much better demonstration of how your arteries are looking than your LDL cholesterol levels. So just focus on that, ask your doctor to run that test. The next mistake is actually not consuming full fat dairy. It's so common to start consuming skim milk or reduced fat milk or just cut out the high fat dairy and start going the lower fat yogurt whenever you can. Look, and I understand from a caloric perspective that makes sense, but you're missing out on really high quality fats. Fat from dairy is actually good. And a large part of the fat from dairy isn't even the saturated fat that you think it is. It's conjugated linoleic acid, which plays some very powerful roles at controlling inflammation, but it also has a powerful job just overall controlling some fat burning. Studies have shown that those that consume more dairy fat, believe it or not, have less risk of cardiovascular disease. But more importantly, for those that are worried about body composition, those that end up taking in more conjugated linoleic acid or CLA tend to lose a little bit more weight. Not a bunch, but a little bit. So when we look at it like that, hey, enjoy the high fat dairy. But here's what's wild. The Scandinavian Journal of Primary Health took a look at over 1,700 people between the ages of 40 and 60. And they looked at them 12 years apart. So first time, and then the second time, 12 years later. Well, what they found is that there was a much less instance of central obesity in those that consumed butter, eggs, whipping cream, and overall full fat dairy, and even cheese. How about them apples, right? That's pretty wild. Then there was a meta-analysis, took a look at 16 other studies that found very similar results. Now, there's a couple things at play here. Reduced fat dairy usually indicates well, a bunch of sugar. Usually they're gonna sweeten up the flavor or make the flavor a little bit better or carry the flavor more by adding some sugar into it. That's common with yogurts, right? You go to low fat yogurt, suddenly there's sugar in it. Uh, now when you look at heavy whipping cream and things like that, yes, you're getting the saturated fats, but you're also getting the conjugated linoleic acid, which is going to help you out. Plus, you're getting the satiety. I would rather you consume some butter than try to go with like a low fat weird margarine spread that's gonna load you up with trans fats but leave you not satiated so you end up eating a bunch more later on. Okay, there are good healthy dairy options. There are overall just good saturated fat options as well. FYI, if you're interested, I did create some specific Thrive boxes. Now Thrive is a, an online grocery store, so they're a market. So mainly like pantry staples and things like that. I put a link down below because I have a pretty cool partnership with them on this channel. So people that watch my videos can utilize Thrive Market to get things that I would recommend at the grocery store. So whether that's gonna be um, some dairy items like Parmesan crisps and things like that, uh, but there's also a lot of other things, healthy macadamia nuts, things that I would recommend. So I have specific boxes. These are like grocery boxes. It's like you're going grocery shopping with me. Point is, it's an online membership-based grocery store, super cool stuff, very convenient if you use the link down below in the description, but make sure you finish watching this video first because I'm gonna wrap it all up and explain it in a simple package so hopefully you can make the right decision when you're shopping for your groceries. So check them out down below. Oh, another thing, use goat milk. Goat milk, goat cheese, uh, goat yogurt, all that stuff. They even have goat whipping cream. They even have all these things if you really wanna get granular and start looking for some of the smaller, smaller farms and stuff like that. But the point is, goat cheese has less of the kinds of casein protein that can trigger inflammation within your body. I wanna keep inflammation somewhat out of this video because it's a very dense topic and I feel like we could just go into a lot of detail in other videos on it, but inflammation really is the root of disease and it really could be the root of why we have a hard time losing weight as well. So anytime that we can control inflammation within the body, we're in a much better situation. Okay, it leads me to the next one, eating too fast. Maybe you don't eat really fast, but maybe you're also not aware of it. Okay, when you're in your 40s, 50s, you're at the height of your career, right? It happens. It's easy to try to just cut corners whenever possible. Time is shrinking on you. And one of the quickest ways to, well, help out your time is just to wolf your food down a little bit faster. Well, there was an interesting study that took a look at 59,000, actually more than 59,000 people in Japan. And it found that those that ate slower had a significantly less instance of becoming obese or gaining weight. Now, it has to do with hormones more than anything. You may think, oh, we're eating slower, you just have less time to eat. No, it actually is hormone related. 25% less ghrelin. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone. Ghrelin is the hormone that signals you to want to eat. When you get hungry, it's ghrelin that is released. 
So if you can reduce ghrelin levels by 25%, you just reduced your hunger effectively by 25%, at least on paper, right? That's powerful. So that explains why there's less of a link with obesity with people that eat slower. So consciously try to slow down. Try to turn your brain off just a little bit so that you're not wolfing your food. Trust me, I do it too. It's something I'm guilty of. All right, number five is one that is super important. As soon as people start getting over the age of 40, their doctors are telling them to get fiber in, right? They're telling them to consume their whole grains. They're telling them to consume things like that. Please, please, please exercise caution with this. Whole grains are not what you think they are. Whole grains are usually full of gluten, which is one of the very inflammatory foods in my inflammatory food lists, okay? It triggers the releases of what are called zonulin proteins in your body, which can cause the intestinal tract to have these little cracks in it where what are called lipopolysaccharides leak into the bloodstream. What ends up happening when these lipopolysaccharides leak into the bloodstream is they signal the brain to think that there's a foreign invader. So the brain signals an immune response. Well, it's a natural immune response to cause inflammation. So inflammation is designed to fix you when you have a bumped knee or a bumped elbow or a sickness. So all of a sudden you have inflammation coming at you and you don't really have a need for it. You just consumed these uh, essentially proteins that are hard to break down in gluten and gliadin. So be very careful with whole grains. Don't just start eating whole grain bread to try to get fiber in. Don't start eating granola to try to get your fiber in. It's the, probably one of the worst things you could do because a little bit of fiber is not going to supersede all the grains and all the inflammation you're getting. If fiber is a concern, use psyllium husk, use flaxseed, use chia seed, use soluble fibers whenever you can. I would recommend just having a little bit of chia pudding. Take two tablespoons of chia with a little bit of almond milk, a little bit of stevia, a little bit of vanilla extract. There you go, you put it in the fridge for like 30 minutes and you make a pudding and that is amazing soluble fiber that's gonna do such an infinitely better job than having, I don't know, some granola or oatmeal to get your whole grains. Just, that is a way of the past. Avoid those extra starches. The very important thing I want to end with, and I hope that you've stuck with me through this video because this is probably the most important piece, mitochondrial health. Mitochondria is the energy powerhouse in our cell. And aging and age-related fat accumulation and age-related muscle atrophy, age-related brain, I guess, atrophy or loss of cognitive function can all be linked to a loss of mitochondrial function. That is where we literally produce energy in our cells. And as we get older, our mitochondria become a little bit weaker and they die off. And we go through what's called a uh, basically mitochondrial dysfunction. They don't function as well. They produce energy inefficiently. If we're producing energy inefficiently, how are we ever supposed to feel like ourselves again? How are we ever supposed to feel young? If you're 40, I can almost guarantee you want to feel like you're 30. And if you're 50, you probably want to feel like you're 40. So let's try to improve that. Well, how do we improve mitochondrial health? Believe it or not, it's by abstaining from food for periods of time. Be very controlled with eating and then not eating. Do not snack. People will tend to tell you that because of your age, you should be keeping your metabolism alive by consistently eating. Please do not. Please do not do that. That does not rev up your metabolism. The thermic effect of food is not all that powerful. It's much better to eat and then give yourself a rest and allow the mitochondria to actually function better. But additionally, practice some intermittent fasting. Go a day or two without eating. Practice a fast because what that does is it forces the mitochondria to go through a healthy form of mitochondrial biogenesis. Basically, the old mitochondria kind of go away and you're left with only the stronger ones. And then the stronger ones go through biogenesis and produce other stronger ones. That's what we want. We want to be left with a lightning fast effective, productive mitochondria. And that will change a very, very big portion of your overall energy, your overall fat loss, and ideally your length of time on this planet. I'll see you tomorrow.